down peg burr and we're at game changers with vicki abelson and our guest tonight is peter page Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this is queer as internet television is this it, it, it's so weird doing this in a living room and things going wrong, the internet going down. Peter, thanks for being here. Sure, of course. <laughs> the internet's up, it's running, this, we're on time. This stuff doesn't happen on the Fosters and on Good Trouble. Oh no, we never have technical difficulties on our television series. Of course, we have technical difficulties every day. That's yeah. the nature of the beast, yeah. It's the nature of the beast. Yeah. All right, so I, I'm excited to do this because I know so little about you, which is usually my guest on the show. I, by the way, Peg, Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Peg. Um, thank you, Peg. <laughs> um, Pete George is in um, Ohio for the Shawshank Redemption 25th anniversary, and they're doing like like 30,000 people are going to converge like in this prison or some and crawl through the sewers together. I, I guess. Know, but that's that's uh, fascinating. I, know. I love that though. I love that. The whole I, you know. cast is there. Except what an amazing thing to be a part of. It, like is, it is an amazing thing. And Pete was in the shower scene next to Tim Robbins, and Tim was the only one who got to wear a little thing over his thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of experience with wearing things over things. Do you? Oh, que queer as folk. Did you? Were you guys wearing yeah. things over things? Yeah. I mean, not always. I did no. some full frontal, too. But it was, uh, yeah, no, I, were I wore naked. what is colloquial called a cock sock for a lot of years. A yeah. cock sock. Yeah, we had our own private ones. They made them special. That is a true story. We're going to talk a lot about <laughs> Queer Spoke because okay. there's like nothing you guys didn't do on that show. That is okay. pretty much true. Yeah. It, it's, um, were you always fearless? Oh, I am the most fearful person you'll ever meet. Oh, stop. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I am, I am uh, afraid all the time, every day. Um, what's, uh, what's great about that is when you just live in a constant state of fear, you, in order to function, you just have to learn to get over it. So, um, so I guess my um, my courage is a response to my uh, my fear based thinking. It, it's really interesting. It's not always that way because I know some. There are some people close to me that are very fearful, and they do not move through it well. Mm -hmm. it, it, it can be I, look. I'm not. I, I I certainly understand that there are people who have um, you know fear that manifests like depression, who have fear that mm -hmm. is so profound that it is stultifying. Mm -hmm. um, I am fortunate that that is not the case, but I am afraid all day, every day, of what's going on in the world, of what I'm doing, uh, of the, the effects of what I'm doing, of uh, how I will be uh, perceived or received, um, uh, and, and then the general sort of state of the planet, state of America, all those things, all, all day, every day. And so, what do you have tools to get you to like if, if you're if you're let's say I'm trying to think of something that would that would put you in fear other than the big world issues which are terrifying to everybody but okay so let's say um, uh, something with work um, um, big meeting pitch big, I have a pitch you have a pitch yeah okay uh, it's a pitch for me honestly is no different than kind of any other day it's I know how to do okay, it okay that's really obnoxious I'm sorry I know but I know how to do it that's what I, I do I go in and I'll tell you a story that's and if I'm passionate about it you're gonna get excited about it I'm gonna get excited about it I that's like that. that's easy to do mm -hmm. um, okay something that's not so easy uh, you know going to a party is not easy for me okay nobody thinks that about me nobody in the world I think of myself as shy literally anyone I say that to is like you're Insane. But you you're know, not I, shy. I totally, I totally relate to that because you, I have the same exact. Right, you because you are not shy by any anyone's so, definition, it, but, except to mine. Exactly, by your own. I know when I yeah. walk in, I'm I'm. Oh my God! What am I doing here? And how? Who am I, I talking to? Belong, and is, and nobody, yes. nobody. Yeah. yeah um, every I time. Got all that. Every time. Okay, so what what push it? What do you use to push through that? You know, you just gotta pair yourself. You just gotta talk to yourself. You know, and just be like, well, you, you then you know you can leave. But that's your, you know, your Friday night. <laughs> so you might as well stay and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and usually within a few minutes, I'm having a good time. But have has your have your worst fears ever been realized? Oh sure. Really? <laughs> yes. Like what? Like give me oh, one. Oh, uh, I like this guy, but I know he couldn't possibly like me. He likes my good friend. That absolutely has been realized. Oh, I'm going to do all this work and I'm going to come in second for this job. That was the entire state of my career. 
for the first few years I was in the business. Oh, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Um, uh, yes, I mean, look, my my these are not worst case scenarios like the plane going down. Right. But I will, you know, I certainly have have lived through uh, things that I or manifested, you know, fears in in my own life and, and made them into realities. I like that sentence because I believe I do. Because yes, I believe we. Yeah. What we put out, we. We get back. Yeah. And it, it yeah, definitely things change. Uh, things change. Things um, change. The more, you know, the filter you put on the world mm -hmm. is the world you as you experience it. So do you find that when you've had success, like do you know, like when you're pitching the Fosters, you just know that what you've got. Yeah, what? I mean, I, I am driven creatively. I'm not driven financially. I'm not driven um, by power. I'm driven by um, telling stories I believe in and that I think will make some small difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And so that um, by the time I get into a room to pitch something to a network, I am already all in. I'm already so excited about it. I can see it. I can believe it. I can smell it. I can, I can tell you what it's going to look like and sound like. So that comes across as passion. And is it, is it, I think it's as much the passion um, as it is sometimes the idea. Oh, 100% it is. Right? I've sold people shows that afterwards I think they realized they didn't really want or didn't know what to do with. 100%. And I'm not, I, I, have, I have producers who would tell you that. They'd be like, he's a great pitcher because people will sometimes buy it and then go, wait, what did we just buy? Because <laughs> that's not going to work. Yeah. So. Passion's worth goes Passion a long goes, every, is, passion's everything. Okay. So let's go back to, uh, all right, wait, I'm, I'm looking to, to see who's here and, and if we need to say hello to anybody. Oh, hi, Karen. Hi, Patrick. Hi, JJ. Hi, Mich Michelle. Hi. So Michelle, Michelle's saying hi to you. Michelle Gardner, who was, was on the Fosters. And JJ and... Are we um, frozen? Or is that just no, frozen? No, that's now? just... We're that's not just frozen. It's, it's moving. It's, okay, great. This is just something weird that's going on. All right. I don't know why it's doing that. But, so it'll make us crazy to look at it, so we don't want to do that. Yeah, that's better. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so anyway, so, so I know... I heard you say today, I was watching something, and, it's, and you said, I'm not from any place. Like, I was born. Mm -hmm. So what's that about? Uh, I was born in Connecticut, moved before I was a year old. In order, uh, it goes Connecticut, Indiana, briefly to Ohio, Illinois, back to Indiana, Maine, Alabama, North Carolina for high school, uh, Boston, New York, Oregon, L.A., Toronto, L.A. And okay. that gets us roughly to today. Okay, so what was all that about when you were a kid? Uh, not a military brat. I was just just, ask. just a brat. Um, <laughs> my parents were divorced before mm -hmm. I was two. Yeah. Um, I lived with both of them for periods of time. They both... <laughs> Honestly, just moved because of work uh, or some nomadic impulse. What did your were your parents creative? Um, my mom is is creative, not in a professional capacity, mm -hmm. um, but she's a very creative human being. Mm -hmm. um, my dad, I uh, is my dad is not creative and would be the first to tell what you. What does he do for a living? Uh, he is retired now, but he um, he ran information systems for insurance companies his entire life. Okay, wow. Well. Yeah. So, all right. He was an IT guy before IT guys existed. Wow. Yeah. So, where did where do you think your passion started? Like, when did you... I decided I wanted to be an actor when I was six. What did it? Uh, I did my first uh, grade play. I played the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. Okay. Um, do you remember your first I line? Loved, I don't remember my first ah, line. Okay. I Probably it was something like, you can go this <laughs> way, you can go that way. It was something along those lines. Um, uh, but I um, loved the process of doing it. I loved the attention I got for doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it fed, I was a kid who always made up stories. I was a liar for one thing, <laughs> but also if you, I was an only child, mm -hmm. I was a lonely child. Mm -hmm. um, my friends were my collection of stuffed animals who had names and personalities and- I was gonna say, and, if you're moving, because I moved a lot, my parents were divorced and it's mm -hmm. very hard. You make a friend and then you're gone. Yeah. And, so you, so you, you know, and uh, also the moving, I, I think, contributed in that I became an observer, a keen observer of human behavior. Because mm -hmm. when you move, I, I like in Maine, I was going to like this funky Montessori like country day school where I called the teachers by their first names. Uh -huh. Literally in the fifth grade, I read Animal Farm and the Communist Manifesto. Literally. 
Okay. And then, uh, and then hey, the, you're allowed to laugh out loud and talk. <laughs> the next year, uh, I was in uh, Alabama going to an old Southern prep school where we wore a jacket and tie. We stood up when an adult entered the room. Wait, we now is that because one lessons. parent, the other parent? I moved, I moved from one parent to the other parent. So I'm guessing it was and the father that was the prep school. And the... It was, but not, don't, uh, was... you're ascribing meaning to it that doesn't have. It okay. was just the best school in Birmingham. I gotcha. And I, I just, my parents both really believed in education and both mm-hmm. made it a priority, which mm-hmm. I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, so, uh, anyway, but when you move a lot for survival, you learn, you learn to read people, you learn to read modes of behavior and read the room, read the room, read the room for survival. And, and so that was, that, that was key in my becoming an actor and definitely has been key in my becoming a writer director. Well, okay. So now when you're in that Montessori school and then you're in that button down, yeah. how are you, how are you doing in those environments? Uh, I... I'm a, I'm a Gemini. Okay. I am I am socially adaptable. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, Look, I, I love Gemini. Oh, thank you. Um, well, a, an evolved Gemini is a delight. An you unevolved need, Gemini is, 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 is treacherous. Yeah. Um, but uh, I so I adapted pretty well. I usually I usually found friends. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one great thing: drama club takes everybody. So, uh, it, which is, I just tell any kid who's struggling, I'm, always, I'm just like, go find, go find drama club, go make props. Even if you don't want to be on stage, go do their props, go do their costumes. They will, they will love they're you. They're your family. I promise you they will love you. Um, did uh, you know you were gay? How, when did you know you were gay? I, I didn't have the word, but I knew I was gay as early as six. I don't, I don't ever remember thinking otherwise. Uh-huh. I remember being drawn to boys in a different way than I was drawn to girls. And, it, and one of the things that drives me crazy, and, and it, it led to a storyline we did on the Fosters, and it's certainly been thematic in my work, but is I, I hate the erasure of gay youth um, for so long because gays were accused of being pedophiles. Uh, gay, even gay civil rights leaders, mm-hmm. w- distanced themselves from kids. Nobody wanted to talk about gay people under the age of 18. For years and years and years and years, even wow. even substantial gay institutions like the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, mm-hmm. it was only it's only in the last decade or so that they've been willing to integrate um, minors into their social service programs, and wow. uh, and so for me it's a really really important sort of talking point that mm-hmm. gay adults start out as gay kids, mm-hmm. and and we are doing ourselves and those children an enormous disservice by pretending otherwise. So how was it for you? being all over the place, going from parent to parent, were, were you comfortable in that? What, did you struggle with it? Was it, were you at, what, what, did you live the life? When did you start living the life? What, what's the life? What do you so mean? I, when did you come out? Oh, uh, so I, I did, you know, I was pretty lucky for a, I, the harder thing than being gay, quite frankly, was I was a crybaby. I still am. I am, I am <laughs> God's most sensitive human being. And, um, well, I will probably cry at some point during this, um, uh, uh, That'll be my favorite part. During this interview. Um, but, uh, that, which was my curse as a child, became my superpower as an adult. And I, that's another of my great beliefs about this life, is the thing that is hardest for you is probably the thing that makes you unique and probably the greatest gift you've been given. Were you bully? You're big. Uh, I wasn't, I was skinny. I was super skinny. I was tall, but I was super, super skinny. And I was such a crybaby and I have no tolerance for pain. Literally, you do that to me and I will, I will wince. I will weep. I don't, I was, I was an easy target. I was an easy target. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to no, no, no. Um, uh, I, uh, I was an easy target because of that for a particular brand of bully. Right. Um, that being said, I was... Loud, I was. Um, oh, I was you, were, of, you were outgoing. I was incredibly outgoing. I was sort of like the. I was like way more outgoing than I am now. I was a That's lot. That's really interesting because you're moving around. You're shy. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. It was my survival technique. Was sort of like here I am, everybody. Aren't I? Aren't I amazing? <laughs> and I also, uh, quite frankly, I needed a lot of approval. And did you get you, it? Uh, generally, I was yeah. a teacher's pet. Generally, uh-huh. yeah. Um, I needed good a lot school. of approval. Smart? Uh, very good in school. School was easy. Thank school God. School was easy. Yeah. And, and in the plays, and, and so you were doing that. I did plays, and I did student government. Did you and do I sports? Was, uh, I did not do any sports, okay. really. I, that was, I, didn't, I, I didn't do anything that I wasn't instantly good at, and I wasn't good. I, did, I had the eye-hand coordination of a crack baby. 
So, um, <laughs> so uh, I was never, I was never much of an athlete. And but acting came naturally. Uh, I mean, I know you Performing came naturally. Uh-huh. Um, I, I had to learn uh, how to really act. Acting, for me, what I think is good acting is something that took me a long time to get to. Well, I heard uh, um, the creators of Queer as Folk talk about the fact, or maybe you talked about it in relation to them, that they realized when they cast you that they had a real actor on their hands and that they were going to write to that. Uh, that. Yes, that was a lovely thing. They, they um, The character of Emmett, uh, maybe we're jumping too far ahead here, I don't yeah. know. But, well, it, we but, can... Yeah, uh, the character of Emmett was conceived as sort of this wisecracking queen on the, high, on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. Um, I came in and I was good at that piece of it, but I also, at that by that point, had had uh, learned to sort of plumb the depths of my own humanity. And so I brought a lot to him, I think. And they, God bless them, they, they instead of trying to keep me in the box they had originally conceived, mm-hmm. they started writing for that. I would take that, we would sort of toss the ball back and forth, and um, and five years later there was there was Emmett. Um, okay, so so let's go back a little bit. So so you you're doing school plays, you're doing well in school, you're socially getting along. Are you having romantic relationships at, in high school and stuff? Yeah, I did. I dated I dated a lot of girls. Oh, um, uh, a lot of girls tried to get me to take their virginity. Sorry, kid, <laughs> they couldn't do it. Um, uh, and then I would sort of, uh, I started coming out around 15. Um, did you did you go out with the girls because you like girls and you were hanging out with the girls? Or did you go out with girls because it looked, because that was what you were supposed I wasn't, to do? It wasn't so calculated as because it looked mm-hmm. good. All my friends were female um, for the most part. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it felt like a kind of a logical extension of mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, did you go to prom? I did. Mm-hmm. I did. The most romantic night, one of the most romantic nights of my life is, is prom night. Um, not with my date, but with my friend's date. Ah! <laughs> Who it's yeah, that's a there's a whole story there, but it was um yeah, we ended up in a mansion. A guy or a girl? A guy. We ended up in a mansion overlooking a river in Dunn, North Carolina, and uh it, my car had broken down. We were driving to the beach, my car had broken down. We ended up at my my date's grandmother's house. And it was girls on the second floor, boys on the third and was a great night. <laughs> I heard you tell a story about another really romantic. Oh, it was about the Adonis guy that oh, you had uh, something yeah. for, and that you ended up getting after some time. Yeah, um, yeah, that was a good story too. That was a good romantic mm-hmm. story. Okay, so so you're having you're having a full a fairly full life. You go where where to college? I know this because we talked before, but uh, I go I go to Boston University. And do you hand pick that because? I knew I wanted to study acting. Mm-hmm. I, I knew I wanted to go to a conservatory. I was... Why did you uh, want to go to a conservatory? I, uh, look, if I had it to do over again, or if I was giving advice to myself, I might not have gone this route. Um, it worked out great. But, it, okay. but uh, I, I think for boys especially, there's, there's, you still have a lot of growing up to do. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe boys could use sort of four years of undergrad and then go to a graduate acting training program, and I think maybe that sort of sets you up for an easier entry into the business. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyway, I was determined. I was, I knew, I had laser-like focus. My dad, who's an incredibly um, conservative man, not in the sort of political sense of the word, but in Mm -hmm. in in terms of sort of the life choices sense of the word, um, even my dad knew better than to try to fight me on my chosen path in life. It was obvious pretty much from day one where I was headed. Were you successful at it right away? I mean, were you the star no. of all the school shows and all? all I was the star of all the school shows. I was. Uh, I did very well at BU in the in the training program. Okay, there. so now talk a little bit about BU because we have people that are. I, I was saying that Samantha went to Tish, did yeah. Tish, and was very afraid of getting into conservatory. I mean, she did apply to a couple, but you get cut. So. Right. Well, that we they had BU had cuts at the time. They don't anymore, um, which I think is a great thing that they that they've gotten rid of that. And but I, I had no idea I got there. And uh, you know, some senior was like, "Congrats on getting here. We'll see if you're still here in two years." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" And they were like, "Oh, oh, cuts. You didn't know." And I was like, "No, I didn't." Um, uh, I was look. It was a specter that hung over all of us. I was never really in danger of being cut. They they have to put you on warning, and I was never on warning. Um, so it was not. Was it something that was like hanging here the freshman it, it, year? And it's sophomore year is when it really hangs oh, there. Really? Freshman year, freshman year, people leave because they go, "Oh, this isn't for me." 
Uh-huh. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to cry all day every day. I don't want to play freeze tag. I don't want like whatever. The, you know what I mean? There's something that annoys everybody freshman year, and they're just willing to do it or not. Um, sophomore year is when they cut the class in half, and so sophomore year has a very kind of oh god, did is I it- did I do good enough uh, feel to it? But mm-hmm. but like I said, I was fortunate in that I knew that I wasn't going anywhere because right. they basically told me so. Um, but, but going through it with your friends, it's, it's an incredibly stressful thing for a 19 year old to go through Yeah, and to, to, and to have your friends come, yeah. to have to say goodbye to people, to have to sort of see people through that. It's a really traumatic thing. I have friends who, who were cut, who still, when you talk about it, they, they, their bodies tense up. They you still were telling the story of somebody friends. who's very successful now. Well, one of my dear, dear friends from BU, she... Got, she got cut, uh, uh, and she's now a big old the giant TV and movie star. Um, so it, it just goes to show people mature at different rates. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's one of the things about actor training is that a huge, a huge thing is just about when do you kind of get into your own body? When do you get comfortable in your own skin? When did that happen for you, do you think? Much later. I didn't really until 30. It was... It was well, did you continue to study? Not really. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I was so studied. I had, I mean, BU was a rigorous, rigorous classical training program. Mm-hmm. So I was studied kind of within an inch of my life. I just needed to live mm-hmm. and relax and get comfortable with who I was so that I could bring it into the work. So when you, I know you did a lot of repertory theater. You did a lot of, mm-hmm. so when, yeah. you, when you got out of school, what was the first thing that you did? Uh, I started doing kind of low pay, no pay theater in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, I struggled mightily. I graduated first in my class from BU. Wow. And and then we went to New York. They presented us to the industry. Mm-hmm. Everybody else got signed by an agent except me. Wow. And it was... That it had to was be devastating. Devastating. It was traumatic. And I... Looking back, it was super important developmentally. I learned how to fight. I learned tenacity. I learned resilience. Skills that I do not innately have. Um, what was it like the morning after that happened? What was the first thing that you remember doing? Uh, I mean... How did you pick yourself up from that? I don't remember it as a as a the next day okay. kind of a thing. Uh-huh. I do. Rem- I remember feeling like, oh wait, everybody's got meetings, and I have this one meeting with this one kind of disreputable <laughs> agent. And I remember going into that meeting like holding my like portfolio, and, like almost rocking back and forth, like the anxiety of it all. The, it became so important, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's so false. I mean, I, I just wish I could go back to to whisper in my own ear and just say like, dude, you're gonna be. Everything you want is out there for you. You're gonna be fine. Just breathe. When did you start to breathe? When did you start to realize that everything was gonna be fine? Uh, no, it wasn't. It really wasn't until Curtis spoke. I, I, so, so I worked in New York. Mm-hmm. Like I said, a lot of low pay, no pay. I occasionally left town to go do a play at like a little, you know, regional. Was your was your dream to do theater? Or did you did you I, plan to? I would have told you my dream was to do theater, but that oh. was a lie. I fell in love with television. I mm-hmm. one of the things like Laverne and Shirley is really the reason I'm an actor. Is My really, friend C- Cindy Beagle wrote for Laverne and Shirley, and Gary Marshall was in the living room, I, and he was brilliant. I, he's, I mean, come on now, Gary Marshall. His, his advice, that. his advice to the writers was, I, I'm sure he's he was genius. He's just what a genius, what a yeah. gift to us all. Um, so I I did want to do TV. It was, I wouldn't have admitted Com- and you that. were drawn to comedy right away? Yeah, I was. Mm-hmm. I was. Uh, although, interestingly, that has not been the bulk of my career. I know. But I was, I definitely had, uh, yeah, I was. Mm-hmm. I was I was good at that. Mm-hmm. And that was my way into when I finally got to LA. But sorry, so New York. Struggled. Just wasn't going my Did way. Did you have day jobs? Oh, God, yes. I had a million different What'd day you jobs. Do? I worked at the Paramount Hotel. I was a registrar at an art gallery. I sold... Uh, I sold a John Waters uh, a painting once. Um, uh, I, That's fun. Um, what else did I do? I, I waited tables at Cafe Mozart at Lincoln Center, but only for a few weeks because then I got hepatitis and almost got the restaurant shut down. <laughs> um, so uh, I, yeah, it was, New York was rough for me. I partied a lot. I, um, I wanted to be up for jobs that I wasn't even in, you know. That is, this I wasn't the up for. is this the eighty? Is this the eighty? It's the nineties. Thank you very so much. So I'm older than you, Vicky Ableson. Is this the eighties? <laughs> I'm old. I'm sorry. Bite me. Is <laughs> it's this the eighties? It's the nineties. Okay. Um, it's the early nineties, but still. Okay. Finally, one day, I basically realized I have to get out of here. I, I'm not. This is not gonna. I, I cannot 
wait to get the off off Broadway play that gets me the reviews of the Voice. How long are you doing this? How long are you? Three and a half years. I was in New York. Okay. Um, I can't wait to get the reviews and the voice that get me the agent, that get me the auditions, that get me the plays that I feel like I should be into. And you're not going I've up for go. commercials or anything like that at this point. No. no. I don't really have an agent at this point. But and you, I, you could have done the, I guess, the... I did open calls. Uh-huh. I did. I went to equity open calls all uh-huh. the time. Uh-huh. You know, but it, 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 it just wasn't... I was, there was not enough work feeding my soul. And I was like, I got to get out of here. So I went to Portland, Oregon, ostensibly to start a theater company with a woman I'd gone to acting school with. Mm-hmm. Um, we fell out within two weeks. Um, we were just both young and it was difficult. And, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, and I almost turned around on my back to New York, but I booked a play and got my equity card. Nice. And in a town, you know, in a, in a smaller secondary city, and this is my advice for a lot of actors. Samantha. You can... You know, once people, you do one play, you do it well, everybody gets excited about you. I broke into Portland's acting scene in one play. What was the play? It was the Young Playwrights Festival. It was actually three little one acts. I did all, I was in all three of them. Literally every great artistic director in town came to see it and was like, you're amazing. Where have you been? What do you want to do? Like it was such a difference from my experience in New York. And it gave me my sea legs. It got me. I got me so cocky you again. You stayed, and what'd you do? I stayed for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. I did Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm-hmm. I did the the Rivals. I did um, a bunch of uh, a little you know little plays um, at the Gay Theater where I made like one hundred and twenty five dollars a week. You know. How did you live? But, um, you know, at the time, uh, I didn't need a lot, and uh, I would pick up an odd job here or there. I was mm-hmm. I was an accountant at a trucking company for a while. Wow. I worked at another art gallery. Like I. You know, I would just sort of, you know, spackle in the holes, and I lived cheaply, mm-hmm. um, and I was really happy. And like I said, I got my sea legs. It got me a little cocky. It reminded me that I was really talented. Do you ever do musicals? A few, uh-huh. not a ton. Mm-hmm. I'm not a great singer. That's not your thing. <clears throat> I love them. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not a great singer. I'm not. I can kind of carry a tune, but like right around the beginning of my career, Les Mis was like the most popular mm-hmm. show on Broadway, and so the era of like the great Broadway singer. Mm-hmm had come in, whereas, you know, before you could sort of get by with like a little, <laughs> a little that. Um, but occasionally I'll get the, I'll get the funny guy part. I did, I did a production of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. I played Snoopy to, mm-hmm. to rave reviews. Nice. Anyway, um, uh, went to Portland, did that for a couple of years. And uh, there was a manager who saw me doing a play there, uh, said, what are you doing in Portland? You should be in L.A., in the two years that I had been in Portland, Friends had come on the air. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching Friends, and I still watch Friends almost every night um, <laughs> as I'm going to sleep. As She's I'm going to sleep. I love you to meet my daughter. I love you. <laughs> um, uh, I remember watching it and going like, I, I can do that. What they do, I do that. And it was the first time since New York had like mm-hmm. kicked me in the throat mm-hmm. that I was like, maybe there is a place for me in entertainment, in professional entertainment, in Hollywood. Like, maybe there is. Mm -hmm. And this manager, his name's Calvin Mason, I owe him so, so much. He believed in me more than I ever believed in myself. Love that. Brought me to L.A. Mm -hmm. Um, My very, very first audition, he he knocked down the door uh, for this big guest star on an episode of Suddenly Susan. Uh, I went... I read opposite. I read against all these guys I recognized from TV. I'm really, like, I've seen your TV show, I've seen your commercials. I know you, and me, this kid who had never done anything on television, basically, went into the room uh, and got the job. Those the two the two creators of that show, the executive producers, had been regional theater actors, and they knew people on my resume, and they knew that if I could do those plays on those stages that I could do a sitcom on their soundstage. I love that. And because nobody else would have given me the job. The casting director didn't want to see me because I didn't have any on-camera credits. I had done a little short film, and I had done a line here and a line there and some industrials and things like that. But like right. in terms of real, right. meaningful on-camera experience, I didn't have any. And Was this so, a real role? Not it, just... was, it was a giant role. It was the, it was the, I had all the jokes. I was, ah! I was the guest star of the episode. That's so and cool. it was great. I have to, and I have it, to it was, find it. It was really, really fun. It was, and it was me... Brooke Shields, Swizzy Kurtz, and Barbara Berry. Mm. I cried for four hours when I got that job because it was, I felt like, it was my first audition in LA and I was like, oh, the I'm universe here. is confirming that I'm in the right place and that, that, that I belong here. Yeah. 
Um, and doing that job, I was, you know, I got that I was nervous as all hell, but I got there on day one, I was like, oh, I, I do belong here. I'm, I'm good at this. And these people are, I'm having fun with these people and they're having fun with me. And um, Kathy Griffin was on that show. And Fantastic. she was, she was hilarious. What did she, she came to my dressing room and she went, I was hoping they'd get somebody good for this job. And they did. And that was it. And then she just walked away. And I was like, wow. I'll take it, Kathy. She wasn't Kathy Griffin back then. Right, she was, right, you know, right, right. She was a chill sidekick. Kathy Ladman was on too. Hi, Kathy. Did, was it Kathy Ladman on when you were on? No, I don't Comedian think so. Comedian also? I don't think and so. And I, Brooke, I know Brooke from back in the day, but. I love Brooke. She was so, she's so lovely. She's still, Brooke still remembers me from my one guest spot on That's the show. She's so, so every time I see her, she's like, hi. Uh, she's such a dear. She's That's a sweet, lovely. sweet woman. Um, uh, so that, that was the week that Princess Di died, by the way. Wow, that was the week my husband got the David Letterman show. He was the head monologue writer for Letterman. He oh. got it that week. It's really hard to be funny when... <laughs> hard to make Letterman yeah. funny when... Yeah. And then right after Princess Di uh, died, somebody died a week later. Wait, who died? Princess uh, Mother Teresa died the next week. Oh. So he was having to make people day funny wow. like when all that was going on. That's that tough. Was, that was pretty yeah. challenging. Wow. So, um, so, so did that give you the confidence? So sure, but then you know you get the confidence. So did you get kicked in the? Did, so all right. Yeah, so what you happened? get kicked again. You know, I came to LA after that. I was like, oh, I'm here. I've arrived. Everybody's excited about me. Where's where's my series? Where's my sitcom? And I, you know, I, like I said, I was second for a lot of jobs. I started. I, you know, there was that job. Tell me, then tell I, me a heartbreak. Uh, I was I was the other choice to play Jack in Will and Grace. Oh. My God! Literally, I went into that audition. I'm in the room with Max, David, and Tracy, the casting director, and I finished my audition. And they were like, "You are fantastic. Um, we are taking someone to network tomorrow. We will not take you against him. Um, if he doesn't book the job, you will. We will. You'll be our next choice." Wow. And that was Sean, who's amazing, and he is. it was great. And, and I got to, was, and I did the part. show, yeah. and it was his part, and it was, it, was his part. it all, it all got. But for a year and a half after that, I tested for show after show and didn't get the job because people were like, you know, "You're reminding us a little too much of Sean Hayes." Oh come on! I swear you to don't God. remind me of Sean Hayes at all. Swear to God. All. It, Sting, yes. Sting, all over the place. But Sean Hayes, no, not at all. At that time, in those roles, where I was... Is your sense of comedy... Do you have a similar I'm, sensibility? It's not as broad as his. It's um, not as broad or as funny physical? as his, quite frank, frankly. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but it is... But I understood why. Mm -hmm. And I was literally like, oh God, was that it? Was that... And by the way, I have a friend, really good friend, who was the other choice for Chandler. And that's Craig that is uh, I mean, I no, that's not, it's not correct. But but, but Craig went on to have a great career. Well, but this Craig, friend of mine didn't didn't. Yeah, but Craig didn't. was supposed to be. Well, he was didn't. offered Chandler. He turned it down. Oh wow. Yeah, he turned well, it down. There you go. Well, there. Yeah. That's a, that's a rough one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a rough one. <laughs> but um, so you know, I for a while I was like, oh god, is this, was this my shot? Was this my moment? Um, and then it wasn't. Thank you god. know what's interesting? I watched you on some shows. Uh, in the Queer Folk Day, mm -hmm. and you had a very different, and I know this is true of myself, a very different energy back then. Very frenetic, very, uh, mm -hmm. like you're so in your body now. You're so... I'm old and tired. Well, no, 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 it's just so interesting because I was watching all of this and you've really had this transformation. But I'm, I'm imagining you going to these auditions as that guy. And so that's why the Sean, it came to me because that I could see where that energy right. might have been. That yeah, and then, I mean, that was sitcom energy, right. quite frankly. Right. And, you know, if I, when I go into, now if I go into a comedy audition, they're like, what you, what you doing? <laughs> you gonna, you gonna bring a little something to it? And I'm like, this is it, this is what I got. This is all I got for you. So, um, uh, so anyway. Uh, so for a year and a half, you're not I thought, yet. I thought, oh God, this is it. And then Queer Spoke came along. Okay, how'd that happen? Uh, a casting director friend of mine stopped me at the gym and said, Showtime just bought Queer as Folk. If I were you, I'd have your manager make a phone call. So I did. Did you know in, anything about it at the time? I had heard about it. Mm -hmm. I had not seen it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I uh, talked to my manager. I was in the first day of pre-reads. Um, I read for Emmett. And then, no, I read for Ted first. I read for Ted first. Um, the casting director, she, was, she said, that was fantastic. I'm going to give you a call back. I said, great. I said, before I go, can I read for Emmett? Now, that was very ballsy. Mm -hmm. what, what, what possessed I you? Know. I don't know. Just 
I don't know, the universe yeah. at work. Mm -hmm. Read for Emmett for her. Mm -hmm. She said, uh, and bless you, Linda Lowy. I'm, I, this is a true story. Don't you, you're not allowed to deny it. She said, um, I don't think I've ever said this before in my career, but which role would you like to come back for? Wow. Again, divine intervention. I said, you know what? You brought me in for Ted. Bring me back for Ted. And I'll tell you why I think that matters. Because okay. when I went in for Ted, mm -hmm. Dan and Ron, the executive producer, stopped me within 30 seconds. They were like, you're fantastic. You're not Ted. Whisper, whisper, whisper. Would you, would you come back and read Emmett for us? Did and they know about the prior Nope. Card? They didn't They know. didn't. And their, I, I, I think their ownership of that moment made me their favorite. Wow. Do you know what I'm saying? I know you, exactly you what get, you're they get They get credit for having that great idea. I didn't come in and say, let me tell you who I am. They got to say, oh, we think you're this person. Wow. And I so was the, smart. I was the first person they heard read Emmett. And as, as Ron tells the story, um, they, once, once you, uh, once you see the shrimp in the buffet line, why would you eat anything else? <laughs> I'm not sure why he was calling me a shrimp. So, so, so nobody else ended up reading, you, you had that part? Other people read. Other people, yeah. Billy Porter tested for that role. Oh, that's crazy. Billy Porter. And I'm so happy for Billy, the moment he is having right now. He has been in the trenches for so long and worked so hard. He is so talented and so has talented. so much integrity. He, Billy came to the premiere of that show. Which I never would have done in a million years. I would have been too jealous and felt too disgruntled, you know, too too sour grapey to to come. He came to that thing. He came up to me afterwards and he said, "Now I know why I didn't get that job. <gasps> I could never, wow. I could never have done what you did." With I just part. saw Billy Porter did something in a commercial at the Tonys, and I can't remember. He sang a number. At, did you see it? There's a video on on. He, he sang, sang a number. He, he, he tore. Anything. Down the house. He, Billy, Billy. I mean, Billy's always been able to sing anything. Mm -hmm. He, Billy, graduated from Carnegie the same year I did from BU. He was already doing Miss Saigon on Broadway when we graduated. Oh wow! And, and he, you know, and he never stopped working basically right. in that in that space. Right. Um, I still remember his Teen Angel. I still, you know, but um, uh, when you know when um, uh, Kinky Boots happened, I'm so happy so for him, and I'm so 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 happy for this moment he's having with Pose. It's so important and so great. But anyway, um, tested, uh, had to come back again because the head of the network had thought Emmett was going to be black. And so when they wanted me for the job, it was he sort of had to wrap his head around that maybe he wasn't going to be black. Um, looking back, I, still, I think Emmett kind of probably should have been, but that, that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to turn it down. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that began the next real chapter of my life. Okay, so how did that... Um First, before we get to that, mm -hmm. how were your, how was your family? How were your parents? When did you come out to them? Were they accepting right away? Did you have struggle with it? What, what was they that? They were great. I, they both had um, discomfort, I think, with it, mm -hmm. um, for various reasons. Mm -hmm. Their, you know, their own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our generation, certainly their generation, didn't have any positive role models of, mm -hmm. of um, you know, what you might call alternative sexuality. Um, and was hidden and lying. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so, um, so you know, they, they had stuff to work through, mm -hmm. um, and I was aware of that for mm -hmm. sure. But they were both loving. I don't, I, you know, they both said all the right things and mm -hmm. were kind uh, about all of it. But what Queer as Folk did, it, what happened immediately before Queer as Folk is it, I'd come out to everybody, but everybody sort of forgot. What? Or sort of didn't talk about it. Nobody forgot. But nobody really talked about it. Everybody sort of acted like they forgot. Everyone just sort of, life went on, but there was no conversations about my intimate life. You know what I mean? Okay. I, I remember going home the Thanksgiving right before Queer as Folk. Mm -hmm. I had just gone through a terrible breakup. I was devastated. And nobody was asking me what was wrong. Nobody, I was at my dad, my dad and my stepmother's house, and nobody was saying like, hey, you okay? And I finally, I was like, you know, you can ask me about my life. You can ask me if I'm seeing anyone. You can ask me... Like, why I'm so sad. How and old are you? I was 29. Okay. 29. Mm -hmm. And my dad was mortified and said, I'm so sorry, and we absolutely will. But what Queer as Folk did is mm -hmm. it blew the doors off the barn. Well, in a big way. In a lot of ways. For a lot of people, mm -hmm. and, but also in my own life. Mm -hmm. it, it, I came out in Time and People and Newsweek and the New York Times and Entertainment Weekly Everyone who ever knew who I was mm. knew that I was gay now. Mm -hmm. So 
it took away. Was that a hard, easy decision? Was that an easy decision? It was an easy decision for me mm -hmm. inside my own skin. Mm -hmm. I was I was already quite an activist and mm -hmm. surrounded by by you know I was marching on Washington and I I was um, you know I, that. I was, I've always been a political human being and, and the fact that my big break came at sort of the intersection of entertainment and politics mm -hmm. is no great surprise. Mm -hmm. So there was no world in which I was going to do a show called Queer as Folk and then, you know, be, hide my sexuality yeah. or lie about it or even off the Okay, but I heard, I, was, I, I watched one of a, a podcast earlier or I don't know what it was and that wasn't true of everyone. It, not, not, not that the actors were hiding their sexuality, but I heard something about, I guess some people on the show weren't actually gay, mm -hmm. some people were, yeah. and um, I know what yeah. it was. I saw you be interviewed, and the interviewer, it was a Canadian interview sh interviewer, and he said something like, he was implying that you weren't gay. That you were just playing somebody who was gay. Oh, no, that was, um, you know who that was? That was... Uh, Oh, what's his name? He's like the most famous Larry King. Oh, it was Larry oh. King. Oh, he was talking. Okay, he Larry was talking. King. Larry King could not wrap his head around the fact that some of us were actually gay, and he just kept saying it on the air. But Larry King, he was so out of his depth in that interview. He had no idea what he was getting into, and he he just kept he kept saying, "So wait, you're no, you're really wait, you're really you're really gay." We, I, me and Randy just kept saying, "Yeah, we're really gay." You can keep asking; it's not going to change the answer. He asked it so many times. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it was. You were talking true. about it on this show, but the interviewer himself oh. was still. I don't think he had a hundred percent acceptance that you were really gay, that everyone was gay. Maybe it, I, don't I don't know. It was weird. I don't yeah, know. I, I'm not here to, fight, yeah. to recount, you know, his journey. Um, uh, but it was a ride. I mean, it, there was there had never been anything like it before on TV. Oh God, I don't. You I don't know? think there's anything like it now. There's not. There's, there's not. not. I, and I. I it makes me sad. I, I don't think Queer as Folk gets enough credit for its its place in the LGBT pantheon, mm -hmm. but I also really don't think Queer as Folk gets enough credit in its pantheon, in for, for its place in the sort of adult, fully sexualized storytelling mm -hmm. that is now a mainstay of cable TV. Mm -hmm. I think without Queer as Folk, I don't think, um, I don't think Fleabag exists. Without Queer as Folk. I just finished with that. Oh my god, so so brilliant. I can't even, I just can't. With her. I just yeah. watched it on season two all again because I just really? loved it so much. The last couple of episodes the, are just like... I, I Literally last night I just sat in bed <laughs> weeping watching watching the last yeah. the last episode of season two. If you've not watched Fleabag, start it it's, today. It's amazing. Season one is very good. Season, season two, two is, is, yes. is, season is beyond. Two, yes, season um, two is worth that. So, uh, anyway, I, Queer as Folk was an amazing, mm -hmm. amazing experience. And it did a, a few things for me. It uh, the most important of which was it made me realize I wanted to be writing and directing. Okay, so that, I wanted to talk about that because we we started a little bit that you would yeah. get invited into the edit bay. Well, so how did that happen? Well, so as so I realized I wanted to start directing. Um, well, what 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 um, you didn't do that in college? Did you do a little student directing? I did in a little student directing, not much. But it didn't turn you. You weren't like driven. No, no, by I, it. I really loved it. In fact, at the end of my college experience, mm -hmm. you know, I just finished a four year acting training program. The head of the program and the head of the acting program sat me down and they were like, you know you're a director, right? And I was like, screw you. What are you I just got to do, what are you talking about? And what I heard really was, you're not, um, you're too ugly and you're too gay to have to succeed as an actor. Wow. That was what I heard. Mm -hmm. So it, I was like, I'll, I'll prove to you, you watch, I'll show you. And, and I, it gave me the axe to grind. Mm -hmm. It gave me my axe to grind. Mm -hmm. Um, which is why I stayed in the game as long as I did and, and why I needed Queer as Folk so much to, to allow me to sort of check that box, the box that I created when I was six, mm -hmm. which was like, I'm going to be a successful actor. That was what I needed to say I had done that. Mm -hmm. It's a false narrative. People can say, you, you don't have to be a series regular on a TV show to say you've had a successful acting career. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it was, what, it, it, was the, it was what I needed. And as soon as I did that, I, I, it became really clear what everybody meant. I was always trying to suppress my, my directorial instincts. I was, I was the one constantly go, going to the other members of the cast and going, you're going you're gonna to hate this take. <laughs> Try it again. Like, you know, trying not to step on the toes of the directors. It was, I was always the one going to the director and going, now why are we doing this this way? Explain it to me because it doesn't make sense to me as a director. Right. 
Um, so well, when did the how did the writing did you always write when did writing yeah, start? writing is something I kind of always took for granted. I was a good writer, and I and it was, in school, and in school, mm -hmm. um, all the way through. It it, it was it was a, a talent that I possessed that I just kind of never never put a lot of energy into because it was always sort of there. Like, okay, what I'm kind of writing this. did you do? I did. I wrote some you know terrible plays and poetry and some short stories and mm -hmm. things like that. You know, um, uh, I I don't have the soul of a writer. I'm not a I'm, you, you know, you can't park me in front of a journal for a good solid three hours every day. I'll, I'll shoot myself, and and I do find the act of of writing to be like it's torture, like torturous. Yeah. Yes, but it, it, I'm a writer, and it's torture. Yeah, it's hard. Well, so. not the act. It's for <clears throat> me. It's the sitting down. Once I start, then I'm fine. Not me. Yeah, not me. I start. I the starting is easy actually. The starting, ah. I'm, it's the Gemini thing. I start. I start every, anything very easily. I get excited. Oh my god, I'm gonna write a novel. Do you, know how many, do you know how many novels I've started? Do you know what Gary Marshall's number one advice to us in this living room was? Tell me. I don't know. Finish. I know. Finish. finish something. That is finish everything. Yeah. Finish. Finish. Yeah. He said that is the difference between success and failure. I agree. Finish. Yeah. Yeah. He maybe shouldn't have finished Valentine's Day. That's, <laughs> that's not. Sorry. Jane. I try not to shake other yeah. people's work. But. Oh. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I, I knew I wanted to direct. Okay, so um, how did that? So how did it start to happen for you? Uh, I, I I was writing a feature. I had been writing a feature for years. Did and you finally, take class? What did you do? I took a class. Um, it's a long, not that interesting story. I took a class in LA, uh -huh. um, mostly because I was reading scripts to make money, um, and oh. so they put me through their training program so uh -huh. I could read their scripts, uh -huh. their student scripts. If that if that makes sense. Like writer's boot camp or something? That's exactly what it was. I did write a boot camp. Writer's boot camp. Yeah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I might have read your script. I might have, I might have commented no, on your script. No, because I would have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, uh, so um, I had the script. I knew. I was like, oh, finish that script. And maybe you can put it together as your first piece to direct. Um, but I also used the show as like graduate school. I never sat in my trailer. One day in five years when I was deathly ill, that was it. Other wow. than that, I would get there in the morning, I would get breakfast in a big tub of gummy bears, and I would go to set. <laughs> um, and uh, I would go to set, and I would stand by the director or the DP or sit at a wow. village, or I would go, I would follow one of the camera assistants around or the gaffer or the grip. I wanted to know how everybody did what they did. Wow. And because I was an actor that they had a relationship with and because I was relatively kind, they were, and, and you know, a lot of people don't ask. Don't ask, what do you do? And why do you do it? And how do you do it well? And, and so I, I was so privileged to get all of this passion and, and information poured wow. into me. And one of the people who did that sort of most um, generously is Wendy Hallam Martin, mm -hmm. who is who won the Emmy and uh, the the Editor's Award, the the Ace Award, last year for editing *Handmaid's Tale*. Um, she is um, her work dear. Is, she's a genius. She's it brilliant. Is so brilliant stunning, editor. stunning. I know. I, I, I season two for me also not, but and no, actually I love season two. Season three was a little bit, but the last would. Her work in the last couple of episodes. Thank you, um, Peg's. You know, Peg. I haven't asked you. If, if, please let me know if anybody. I just. I see everybody's making like hellos and everything. But if anybody has questions, you know, do let me know. I don't see any questions. Okay. So. Um, so. Ask us questions, guys. Yeah. We have, you, we, have a, you, we have like ten minutes left. So ask us questions. Ask questions. So. Um, so anyway, so Wendy, who's a genius. Yes. She was the editor of Chris, one of the editors of Chris Folk, and she and I became friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't allowed, but she would sneak me into her edit bay, and uh, and teach me. And mm -hmm. that editing is where you learn how to direct. It's really it's for film and TV, a hundred percent. Wow! It is. It's because you. The most important thing to understand for directing film and TV is is how to get the pieces of the puzzle that you need. And she would show. She'd be like, "Okay, here are the pieces that I have. Um, what don't I have?" What do I wish that I had that would make this scene better? Or, or how should I put this together? What's a more interesting way into this scene than this normal two shot? You know, it, 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 she would just pose these questions to me and let me sort them Figure out with out. her. Mm. And it, it, was, it was such an extraordinary gift. 
she direct she cut my first feature, Stay Uncle. So now all the pieces there, and you're just having to find them. Well, in this in this was Queer as Fuck. This was the right. show as we were shooting it. So she'd show me scenes and. But be, would she know. ever go to the director and say, "I don't have what I need"? Sometimes, not very often. That, uh -huh. that usually in television, an editor's job is to make, make it, it work, work with what's there. Yeah. Uh, so generally, that was mm -hmm. the case. But occasionally, you know, you show it to the executive producers, and then they come back and go, "We don't have what we need." Yeah. So they they're the ones who would pull the trigger on, "Oh, we're going to do a little pickup or mm -hmm. reshoot or something." Mm -hmm. We didn't do it very often, but mm -hmm. occasionally. Um, but I learned so 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 much from her generosity and. She cut my first film, that, that film that I was writing all that time, uh, Say Uncle, which... So the first film that you wrote, you got produced? I did. I did. I mean, I... You've I've, had a lot I've, of first... You've had a lot of good first looks. I did. I did. That's true. That's true. It doesn't it feel... Um, they were all hard-earned. They were all hard-won. How hard long won. did you work on Say Uncle? I was writing Say Uncle for seven years. Okay, thank and you. And it took me two it was years... Because be a little annoying if no, you No, and it took best. me two years to raise the money for it. Um, and I put in a huge amount of my own money. Did I you? probably put up 50% of that Did budget really? myself and lost it all. Mm -hmm. So it, it But um, was it worth it? Looking back, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I call it very expensive graduate school. <laughs> so I'd like, you know. That it, it prepped was what it was. you for the foster, like that prepared you to. to for Absolutely. What you, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I was really Kathy fortunate. I got a great cast Kathy and Jimmy, Gabrielle Union, mm -hmm. Melanie Linsky. Um, pretty much everyone I had ever loved in some project, at least Edelstein, I, everyone I loved, I was like, will you be in my movie? And they all said yes, and yeah. I was like, amazing. <laughs> so I had an incredible cast. Mm -hmm. The movie is, uh, is, is um, it was really brave. Um, I got a five-star review in the LA Times and a zero-star review in the New York Times. Wait, what? Which How I think is, is that possible? That's, that's what the movie was. People either totally got it and loved it or totally hated it. Wow. And and I always wanted, I never did it, but I always wanted to cut those two reviews out and put them in the same frame <laughs> to remember that, like, everything is subjective. Yeah. Everything is subjective. Mm -hmm. Would I rather have the five-star review in the New York Times? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> but that's not what happened. I feel you. That's not what happened. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but that made it really, that cemented that I loved doing that. And then I was pretty good at it, mm -hmm. and I started. Um, I started writing. I got a writing partner, Bradley Bredewig, who is still my producing partner to this day. Okay, so how did that? Um, where did you have the idea for the Fosters before you came together, or did no. that happen together? No, no, no. We we wrote. We had written and sold a bunch of pilots together oh. before the Fosters. Oh, there was a there was a. It was almost a five year period, probably more, six year period, after Queers Folk ended. Um, I was still acting for a while, then that, then that sort of, I sort of down shifted that and we shifted up selling, you know, writing pilots and TV movies and features, but nothing got made. And it wasn't until the Fosters that something finally got Did made. Did you go back to train to learn how to do, how to write TV as opposed to how to write a screenplay? How to... No, yeah. it, it, I had friends who were, who had made, I, my closest friends from BU, mm -hmm. one is Krista Vernoff, who is now the executive producer of Grey's Anatomy and a huge deal in mm -hmm. Hollywood. Uh, my other best friend from college is Abraham Higginbotham, who's executive producer on Modern Family. Um, and uh, Michaela Watkins, mm -hmm. the, my aforementioned f friend, uh, who's a big giant TV and movie star. Those are like my three people from, from that time. Wow. And we all came up together mm -hmm. and everyone was really thoughtful and generous and encouraging. And both Abraham and Krista had gone into the writing space before I did. While uh -huh. I was on Queer's Folk, they had both transitioned and become writers. Mm -hmm. So I had these two great, yeah, mentors, and and just just um, I could just watch them do it. And I was like, well, they can do it. I can do it. There, I I'm, I'm, I know these idiots. I'm I'm the same idiot they are. <laughs> so uh, so I you know I certainly got a lot of advice and I got a lot of counsel and I read a lot of articles and I read things about format. How did you uh, connect with your partner? He, uh, it's not that interesting a story really. He was working in development. He saw Say Uncle. He liked it. Two years later, he quit that job. Called me. No one knows why to this day. He doesn't even really know why. Called me and said, I need to be doing something more creative. I'm looking to you know, start a production company or something. I want more creatives to partner with. Will you have coffee with me? So we did. We're, we're down to, oh my God, well, five minutes. Vicky, um, yeah. we got a question from Kelly okay. Ann. Go ahead. Why do you think there's such a surge in reboots? Why so much nostalgia? Do you think Queer as Folk will be rebooted? Would you do it if there was a reboot? Uh, I would happily do it if there was a reboot. I would love it. 
Um, I don't know. I think there's right now there is a reboot that doesn't include any of the original. Oh, really? Cast. Um, we'll see how that plays out. I don't. You never know how things how things are going to come to be. Um, I I think uh, here here's I think it's twofold. I think nostalgia is really powerful in difficult times. Mm-hmm. I think we all like to remember times that were easier mm-hmm. um, and better for us. And I think that's what I think that's the grip it has on us as a as a people right now. Um, in terms of just the business, the we are in a time where there are seventy buyers. There are seventy channels crazy. making content, mm-hmm. and they all need something that could potentially grab people out of the ether and get them to sit down and watch their programming. Mm-hmm. And so, a brand, any brand mm-hmm. that has some meaning to people, mm-hmm. is powerful. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why everyone's just going, you know, for weddings and a funeral. People love that movie. Let's make it into a series. We'll do it in 10 episodes. It, it is, it, you know, it has nothing to do with the original. Nothing. But there are four weddings and a funeral. Um, you know, it, it's Hawaii Five-0. Hawaii Five-0 is nothing like Hawaii Five-0. Right. But it's, but it, there it is. It's a brand. It's a brand. Yeah. it's a brand that got people to sit down and watch and now it's going into its 10th season. Mm-hmm. So that's my belief about reboots and why they matter so much. Um, uh, so where did the idea for the Fosters come from? Uh, we, Brad and I were looking at sort of the TV landscape. We were like, instead of chasing a wave, which is really unfruitful, we try to chase the vacuum. What's not there? What's not, in, what's not on the air that you love? And um, there were no family dramas on the air. There was one. Parenthood was the only family drama on the air at the time that we pitched it. And we both love family dramas. And we thought, what would our family drama be? We're both, you know, gay men. Uh, so we talked about doing a two dad show. I was going to say, already, what, what made you? Dads were already being done. They were being done in the comedy space. They were uh-huh. Glee, Modern Family, mm-hmm. The New Normal had just come on the air. Mm-hmm. So we were like, whoa, wait, two moms. Every lesbian couple I know has kids. And nobody's talking about that. But how did two men write this <laughs> thing for two <laughs> lesbians? How do you do that? How do you get inside that head? You, I mean, you know, I. I, I, we drew on our moms. We drew on our friends. Um, we're gay men. You know, we, we share certain sensibilities with mm-hmm. women. And uh, I don't know. You know, we just did it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it worked. And then, you know, we brought in Joanna Johnson to run that show with us. And Joanna is a lesbian and has a wife and has kids. And so we got to just steal a ton of her life experience and put it onto that show. So, yeah. um, so there you go. Mm-hmm. And then uh, that show ended, and they the network asked us if we wanted to do a little spinoff, and so we created Good Trouble, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm super super proud of. I hope people are watching. It's on Freeform and Hulu. Um, it's so it's on Hulu, so you can binge the whole whole thing. I like it's it. I'm gonna do so it. So good. It's a really it's a great show. A really I think um, a really vital portrayal of life in your early twenties when everything is so important. I like to say it's about that period in life where you're. Fucking, fucking, fucking up, getting fucked, getting fucked over, and fucking it all up. <laughs> I have to, I have to watch this with my daughter. She's in New York and I'm here, but we binge shows mm-hmm. together. That's a perfect show to do. Uh-huh. I think you'll enjoy it together. Mm-hmm. So that sounds like a good one. Yeah. So, so what if you could write your perfect future? What does it look like? Uh, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. I got more stories I want to tell. You know, um, I got Anything a, I got a stack. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm, not, know, I'm not at liberty to, to discuss. I don't want uh, you to tell, but I mean, I, is there something that's really yes, calling you? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there are a few things, actually, that I'm really excited to get out into the into the universe. And, and at this point of things, what thrills you the most? Directing, writing, producing, acting? Um, my greatest joy, my easiest joy, and everyone who knows me will tell you this when you see me, is, is directing. It's my happy place. I just love that. Um, on a set with a, with 200 people staring at me, uh, for some reason, it's, 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 it all makes sense to me. It utilizes sort of every part of my brain. Mm-hmm. I find it really, really satisfying. Um, but that being said, I ain't quitting writing. Um, I'd still act if the right thing presented itself. Um, I actually really enjoy producing at this point in my career too. It, that that um, what is active producing for you? What does that look like? It's uh, it's problem solving mm-hmm. more than anything else. It's mm-hmm. coming up with creative solutions mm-hmm. to uh, to mm-hmm. anything from tiny little problems to really really big challenging ones. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and uh, and I and I've come to enjoy that that lot. And again, it's about it's about using a different you know piece of my brain every day. So um, that makes me super happy. Well, I am uh, super happy to have gotten to know you. I, I we we have mutual friends and we vaguely, but but now you're a real person. And, uh, <laughs> now you're a real person, and I really like the real person. Well, thank you. That's lovely and, of you to say. Back at you. And, and, I enjoyed and, our time together. I'm so grateful that you did this, and and I'm, I I really am going to push this show in a really hard, in a really big way because I think you gave a lot of valuable. I hope so. There's guidance here. I hope so. Uh, yeah. it, it, my career wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been easy. It, it sounds like it in retrospect, and I and I am very grateful for it, and I know I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't easy, and um, and so I you hope, really I hope that do I, the work. I, I I I think I really do the work. You really so do the work. That's what I, I got through everything. I hope that that's. I hope that people take that as inspiration. That's the takeaway so. for me. Do Good. the work. Do the work. Really do the work. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, Peg, Bye, thank you so much. Thanks, Peg. Thank you all, and um, we'll see you next week. I can't even think. Bye, everybody. Now. I see. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Thank you. So you just want to hit the end button, that little red button. The finish. The finish.